started it. <laughs> she, uh, Sarah Lippincott is a librarian and library consultant with a decade of experience supporting open access, digital scholarship, and scholarly communications. As head of community engagement at Dryad, Sarah works with institutions, funders, and researchers to increase awareness of and engagement with data sharing and data reuse. She received her um, master's in library science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And before joining Dryad, she worked in a variety of roles within and adjacent to libraries. Uh, she started out her career as the founding program director for the Library Publishing Coalition and has had many, many diverse and interesting roles in the information science and education world. And today she is here to talk to us about companion planting, how generalist and specialist repositories can work together to promote agricultural data sharing and reuse. And with that, take it away, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm really um, happy to be talking to you all today. Um, uh, uh, thank you so much for inviting me um, to, to join your, uh, your webinar series. Um, so, so yes, I, I couldn't resist a kind of cheesy plant metaphor um, in, in the title. Um, and, but, uh, uh, and I'm going to keep my, my remarks fairly short. I think um, I, you know, I hope I can give you a kind of example of the ways that, um, that researchers are already using Dryad in this way, uh, kind of working together, uh, combining um, the, the, the capabilities of generalist and specialist repositories. Um, and I, but I'm looking forward to having a conversation with you about where we go next and how we can grow this type of collaboration. Um, so uh, just to, to reiterate, I'm the head of communication, community engagement at Dryad. I'm also a trained librarian with an interest in advancing open and equitable scholarly communication. And about Dryad, if you're not familiar with us or haven't uh, haven't been you know haven't um, kept up to date with us in a while, we are an open data publishing platform and community committed to the open availability and routine reuse of all research data. So we cover um, we cover all research domains and all file formats. Um, we are a non-specialist data platform with over 50,000 data publications, representing the work of over 200,000 researchers at over 70,000 institutions around the world. And our data publications are connected to articles in over 1,200 academic journals. Um, Dryad's origins were, were in, um, in uh, in it, our connection with journals, um, journals specifically in the ecology and evolutionary biology communities who wanted a, a place, a trust, a trustworthy, reliable, um, independent place to, to store data um, underlying their published research. We've grown out, we've expanded quite a bit from that original remit um, and now serve all research domains. And we serve data that isn't connected to a publication in a journal. All of the data and metadata in Dryad are curated by our team um, to ensure that they're suitable for publishing and to facilitate their discovery and reuse. We permanently store everything in our core trust seal certified repository. Um, so this is a, a digital preservation repository. We have, have uh, copies in multiple location, different geographic locations. Um, we 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 do uh, you know uh, continual monitoring of of files um, over time to ensure that they'll be there for the next generation of researchers. Everything in Dryad is published under a Creative Commons public domain CC0 license. Um, this can be controversial in some fields, uh, uh, but um, but it's it's a core part of our our identity as an organization and, and our mission of removing barriers to reuse. And everything uh, that we publish is accessible for free to view, download, reuse uh, on datadryad.org and through our API. Um, so what I'm gonna talk through today is a, just a brief introduction to Dryad. I've, I've already basically done that. Um, I'm going to give a perspective on the value of generalist and specialist data publishers. I think this isn't something that's going to be new to this audience at all, but I hope it serves as a, a kind of a starting point for the conversation um, or a foundation for uh, for some of the questions that I'll have for you later on. 
Um, I'll give a, a just a, a case study, an example of of how Dryad is already serving as this kind of as how how researchers are using Dryad in combination with specialist repositories and and um, how we're playing that uh, uh, kind of uh, networking role. Um, and then I want to collaboratively strategize with you on how we can en enhance those types of connections. So we at, at Dryad, we you know we believe that science is a social process. Um, this is a quote from uh, from a, an editorial in Science. Um, and you know, we believe that discoveries don't become knowledge until the findings are shared with the scientific community to be vetted, challenged, and expanded upon. Um, so that's behind everything that we do is making that data available for that social process of science um, for the um, you know, so that data has a life beyond its original intended use, um, and so that it can be put into conversation with other other research, um, so that it can be interrogated and validated by others. Um, and um, I, I, again, I think I'm not saying anything that's going to be new to any of you, um, and I'm probably preaching to the choir. Um, but um, but uh, you know, reuse and and putting data into a conversation is a core part of of our mission and behind everything that we do. And we also, you know, this is also particularly um, topical and timely because of data sharing policies, um, the, the NIH data sharing policy, the OSTP memo and other government, you know, other federal agencies that have, have now followed the lead of NIH um, in developing data sharing policies. Um, and, you know, so among other things, you know, what the, what many of these policies, many of these policies have provisions like uh, whenever possible researchers should share data in discipline specific or data type specific repositories. Otherwise they should trust a generalist repository. But what happens in the many cases where a project has both, where they have data that is appropriate for, that, that has a discipline specific home um, and then other data from their project that doesn't, that doesn't fit in. Um, and this happens in many cases. Um, so how do we ensure that um, data from projects like these is in conversation that it, you know, that it retains its integrity for, for future, you know, replication of studies, um, that it um, retains its connection, you know, across different platforms so that it continues to be useful and reusable um, over time. Um, you know, I th I think the, these policies acknowledge, and I think again, we all know that generalist repositories and specialist repositories have distinct advantages. Um, you know, specialist repositories are obviously optimized for the needs of a particular discipline or a a, a particular file format or type. They may support niche file formats um, that uh, and and are op. They have you know optimized processes and display and interactivity for different uh, file types that are um, prevalent in that discipline. Um, they serve as community hubs as well um, for disciplinary communities. And, you know, th this, this uh, group is an example of that where, uh, you know, where, where there's a community that has formed out of the, the connection between, um, you know, multiple uh, disciplinary repositories. Um, but generalist repositories have a really key role to play as well. Um, they can they accommodate the the vast uh, you know sea of data that doesn't have a specialist home um, because of its topic or because of its file type um, or because it's interdisciplinary. Um, so they provide a home for data that might otherwise go unshared and might might sit on a server or um, you know on uh, you know on. Uh, a disk um, and never never be be shared uh, properly. Um, and we can facilitate because of the hetero heterogeneous nature of the data that we collect, um, we can facilitate serendipitous discovery and broad discovery, which I think is a really a really um, key um, driver of what we what we do and an aspiration is that we want to to be a place where uh, where you can find data that um, that you might not have have realized was uh, was of use for your your specific research area or where others who um, who have a research question or an interest can find data that they can use in ways that was never even intended by the original creator. 
Um, so we're expanding a potential audience for data sharing where we have a, 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 a bigger profile in, in a lot of cases, um, than, than a, than many disciplinary repositories, um, and, and are expanding an audience for data reuse in general. Um, and we can be a, a, a driver of, of then of data reuse in other platforms as well. Um, uh, and um, so, so there's a, you know, there is a, I, I think there's a continuing role for both types of repositories going into the future. And especially as we, um, as we, we are in this era of, of policies that are mandating or, or heavily encouraging the sharing of data. And when we anticipate a growth in the, the volume of data that will be shared over, over the next several years, um, a huge, huge growth potentially. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, kind of key, key, um, so I, I want to kind of go through an example of, of, a, of this use case of, of publishing data in multiple repositories, what that looks like, um, as a, as a, as a framing for, for this kind of discussion of how do disciplinary and generalist repositories, how do they not only complement one another, um, as I've just shown, but how can they actually be used together, um, so, you know, there, there are a few, I think there are kind of two major use cases that I think of when I think about when data from a single project might be shared in multiple repositories. The first is when a project produces multiple data types or formats, um, and there are subsets that might belong in a specialist repository due to their file type or subject matter and subsets that don't have a home, um, but they're connected to the same, they were collected, you know, uh, for the same for the same purposes, um, to answer the same research question, and they're used in conjunction in doing an analysis. Um, or there's a specific funder requirement that says data needs to go in into a certain home, um, or, or subsets of it, of the data need to go into a certain home, and others uh, aren't subject to that requirement. Um, and then the other consideration is is when there are confidentiality concerns. If there's raw data that's too sensitive per, for broad sharing that needs to go into a, um, a, you know, for example, like a closed clinical trials uh, database, but there might be subsets of data or processed data that could be openly distributed and might have uh, uh, a utility um, uh, to be shared broadly. Um, and again, I think the focus here is on is on reuse, uh, is ensuring the the broadest possible opportunities for reuse, whether that's re reproducing results, replicating results, repurposing data, building upon data, performing meta analyses, um, or even things like seeding machine learning algorithms. Um, and I think that's it's key. That's you know. This is a key when we're thinking about um, you know everything that we we do, all of the features we develop, all of our services and policies are focused on on this um, broadening of reuse. Um, we are and, and we're seeing this also as a, a key focus in a lot of disciplinary communities as well. Um, so this was a recent editorial published in um, Ecology and Evolution. This is so it, it, the ecology and, and evolutionary biology communities are also seeing that too often, oops, um, too often open data are uploaded kind of piecemeal. Uh, they don't have the accompanying metadata or they're missing context. Um, that happened before the data deposit. Um, they also may be missing like connections with other data sets or other, you know, other code or other pieces of, of, of research output that, that make them reusable. Um, and so, and the, as the authors of the, this editorial say, the potential for reuse of, of data sets like that is, um, is, is greatly reduced when they don't have all of that context and all of those connections. So we are making and sustaining those connections at Dryad. That's our that's our goal, um, and I want to give a kind of a case study of how that works right now, and then pose a question to you of how do we make that work better? Um, you know, how do we build upon what uh, what we can currently do um, in terms of of keeping those connections? 
Um, so this is a, a data set that, that it, we published in 2022. Um, so uh, putting myself in the shoes of a researcher whose study uses genomic data in combination with landscape dispersal and occupancy data to inform conservation unit delineation in Nevada, populations of the Great Basin distinct population segment of the Columbia spotted frog. Um, so this study has raw uh, gene sequencing data, um, and they also have filtered data, um, so a subset of that data. They've deposited the raw sequencing data um, into a, a bio project um, at the NCBI um, and the filtered data into Dryad. Um, so to build connections between these two data sets, how to keep them together, because one informs the other, They're, they can't be, they, they don't make sense independently. Um, they, you can't reproduce the results of this study without both of these data sets, but they're in different repositories. So building connections and providing context here is key. Um, so some of the things that I think they've, they've done really well in this instance that, and that Dryad has helped to facilitate in some cases are indicating the use of multiple repositories in a data management plan um, so that that's clear from, from the outset that that's the intention um, and, uh, uh, and that, that that is, is recorded somewhere. Um, They've added persistent identifiers for related data sets and other outputs. They've described how and why data has been divided between repositories, and they've strategically applied metadata. So, you know, for example, um, you know, indicating in a data management plan, you know, that raw data has been made available in, in, in this database, filtered data has been made available in Dryad. They've added persistent identifiers. So this is the data set uh, on Dryad's um, uh, platform. Um, so they have this is the data set deposited in Dryad. They've added uh, a related item um, when they've submitted their data to us. They added the DOI or the persistent identifier for their data set in NCBI. So anyone coming to visit this data will see the link to this data set, and they'll also see described in the abstract that the authors provided on Dryad, uh, the, the, they'll see that noted that this additional data set uh, has been deposited at N NCBI, and they'll see in the readme file that's associated with this data set, uh, that reference, and they'll see the methodology of, uh, you know, for, for the data collection and processing. They've also added um, a, the a DOI for an article that was uh, um, written, at, um, you know, that that writes up the results of this this study that was used uh, that the data was uh, collected for. Um, and there as well, they've provided both the Dryad DOI and the um, NCBI URL in the. Um, in the data availability statement there. So this is a, a nice package of all of the context that a researcher would need in order to replicate this study. They've also strategically applied metadata. Um, so this is the, the keywords in Dryad, the keywords on that molecular ecology article and, um, and uh, some, uh, some of the metadata from NCBI. So, so you can see where they've, they've replicated keywords in Dryad and in this molecular ecology article, they've referenced the the you know the taxonomic name of the organism that they're dealing with um, in in all three places. Um, so they're they're providing this you know machine readable metadata um, in uh, uh, and and providing you know using a, appropriate discipline specific. Uh, uh, vocabulary and and um, you know taxonomic names to help make this more discoverable um, and to link all of these together. Dryad supports uh, you know supports a, a range of of uh, just uh, just to kind of note that Dryad supports a range of persistent identifiers in addition to to collecting DOIs um, uh, and and other um, URLs for related works um, that also help to connect Dryad information in Dryad to other um, to the creators, funders, um, and and stakeholders and other outputs. So just to kind of um, illustrate that, we collect ORCID IDs for researchers. We use research organization registry IDs for institutions. We provide DOIs for each data set through Data Site. 
Um, we provide metrics that conform to make data count standards. Uh, we collect citations of the data set. So, so again, continually over time, you'll still be able, you'll be able to keep up with work that builds upon um, this data set or reuses it in some way. We provide a suggested data citation. Um, we provide versioning of data sets, these related works, which I think are one of the key things that, you know, the kind of key pieces of the puzzle that we provide uh, of that kind of connective tissue that we support. We provide funding information that's linked to the Crossref funder registry um, and licensing information. So there's a variety of ways that that we can um, that we can leverage this structured data that's tied to persistent identifiers um, to to connect data in various ways to creators, funders, etc., um, and and to make it more discoverable and interoperable with other systems. But I think there's lots of room to grow. So this is where uh, I I want to to put out some ideas and and then ask for your feedback. So I think the first area where we really have room to grow is supporting discipline specific metadata. We're not a discipline specific repository, um, and we can't possibly support, uh, or at least not immediately support, discipline specific metadata for every discipline. Um, and that wouldn't really, that wouldn't necessarily conform to our mission. But I think what we can do is improve upon upon this, where we have, you know, free text keywords that that an author enters, um, and so we're relying on authors and to a certain extent to our data curators to to have uh, you know keywords that are consistent that are you know high quality and conformant with disciplinary standards um, and these are, are are not truly you know interoperable and they don't give us uh, they don't give us real interoperability with discipline specific repositories um, and they don't support discovery as as well as they could um, so one of the one of the projects that we are, currently working on is piloting, collecting some discipline-specific metadata. Um, because our, our roots are in ecology and evolutionary biology, that's a community that we're, we're focusing on currently. Um, I would love to discuss this in particular with this group as well, because I know that you're interested in, in that very topic of support of, of you know, supporting um, best practices in metadata in, in your communities. Um, and so this is something that we want to do. We don't want to, um, again, we're not looking to become a discipline specific repository, but we are looking to interoperate better with discipline specific repositories to support discovery across repositories so that we can surface um, related data or make our data surfaceable by by other, um, by aggregators um, and, and other mechanisms for finding related data sets. Um, and I think so. I think the you know that that leads into this second point here of strengthening our connections with discipline-specific repositories. We we I would love to to see a world where we could support um, support discovery of of dryad of related data from dryad in in other you know from other repositories um, or or have you know pathways of, for connecting related data in both disciplinary and, um, and generalist platforms, um, again, to, to, so that, because we know that there's, um, there's never going to be a one size fits all solution. There's not going to be one place where all data should go to, to live and then be discoverable. Um, but if we want researchers to be able to, um, to conduct, uh, you know, uh, robust meta analyses, or if we want to support, um, uh, you know, uh, better discovery through machine learning or, uh, you know, and, and all of these uh, kind of next next generation research practices, we need to be able to to query across uh, across silos. Um, uh, the third the third point that I'm curious to talk about with you is is supporting author wayfinding. Um, so by this, I mean, um, when an author comes to Dryad and they have they have a uh, multiple types of data, how do we alert them? Oh, you have gene sequencing data. Are you sure you want to put that here? Um, you know, can we help to direct them to appropriate repositories where those exist and only take the data that doesn't have a better home elsewhere? 
Um, and again, this is another uh, you know way in which I think we can strengthen our connections with with discipline specific repositories. Um, you know, being able to identify what are the right places is the first challenge there. I think because uh, you know again, there's there's a, a whole universe of of possibilities. Um, but are there ways that we can um, can collaborate collaborate to uh, make it less challenging for researchers to figure out where they're supposed to put their data? You know, what's the best home for it? What's where is the uh, you know who's the best steward for their particular type of data? Who's going to get it in front of the right audiences, et cetera? Um, and I'm curious what other ideas you might have. Um, for me about, about how, how, uh, what the role of, of a repository like Dryad or a data publishing platform like Dryad is in relation to your, uh, your communities and, um, and how we can work together to support, I think our shared missions of, of data stewardship and data reuse. Um, so I'll, I'll thank you first and, um, and then, um, invite your questions and comments. Thank you so much for that. That was absolutely, um, fascinating. And for me, at least you touched on a lot of points that, um, I've been thinking about as well. You're getting a lot of, uh, applause here. Um, so uh, as far as uh, questions or comments, there's a comment in the chat from Peter Selby um, about maybe, um, Peter, if you want to sort of hop on and explain about um, how you think that BRAPI, um, the BRAPI standard could serve as this discipline specific metadata standard. Do you want to kind of address that? Uh, can you hear me now? Absolutely. Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. So yeah, I, I just uh, dropped a dropped a note in the chat here. So yeah, I'm, I'm uh, Pete Selby. I, I um, organize and manage the the Brappy project, which is a, a an API metadata standard um, for for breeding data. Um, and so yeah, that's one of the things that you know we're we're trying to do in the Brappy community is is encourage a lot of the data sharing um, and and data reuse and data accessibility, um, and so uh, uh, that's you know that's a lot of the things you were just talking about is, is see a lot of connections there. But it is you know very discipline specific for for breeding data and and gene bank data and that sort of stuff there. So um, yeah, I just I wanted to call it out. And yeah, if you've got any other questions or anything, I, I'm always always happy to chat. It's my it's my whole thing. Thank you. I, I will take a look at that and I will probably follow up with you. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking to pilot with multiple communities, you know, what, what it would look like to collect, um, to collect metadata and, uh, and, um, uh, and test it out with, with researchers who are already interested in, in adopting, um, such a standard. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So, I have a question sort of that, that's a follow up to that. And, you know, you about how um, in, in the in the work that you're already doing about interacting with communities, like, you know, can you give sort of an example of procedurally how one might do that? Like, you know, if we come come up and define metadata standards, you know, what what does that collaboration look like to you? And then I will get to um, Doreen and Timothy after. Um, so, you know, we're still in early stages. We have been working with, um, with a, uh, we've been working with a, a project from out of Stanford called Cedar that has developed metadata templates. Um, and so that's, that's one, one avenue, uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, um, looking at using their technology to, um, to implement forms that we could then test out with researchers. So I think a collaboration would look like, you know, taking a look at what what are the what are the key metadata elements that we can collect. It might not be everything in a standard. So I think that's part of it is defining. You know, what are the what are the key things that um, that a, a generalist repository might collect um, that that would be useful in this community. Um, and then I think testing it out with testing out the form with some researchers actually trying to um, uh, to promote. Uh, the use uh, of it, doing some user testing, but then also working with the community to um, to 
to help spur adoption. Thank you. Um, Timothy? I think Doreen was first, but I'm happy to go. She passed to you first. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Um, um, right. I've got too many questions. I'm not sure which way, where, where, where should I start. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got um, some question about uh, metadata and how you would... Um, well, actually, let's start with, with data first. Um, how do you envision that you could confirm that the data that is being deposited is of the correct format, or at least of the specified format. Mm -hmm. uh, is it something you're performing already? Is it something you would want to perform? Um, so we we have Dryad has a team of data curators. So we do we look at every data set, um, and you know currently we don't we don't have a um, a. a we, you know, we accept any format. Um, if we were you know and if we were. Um, working with discipline specific metadata that that had that's something that our curators would also check so if we were implementing one of these you know these additional forms to gather metadata that would be part of the process that we would have to implement is making sure that our curators are are equipped to to actually to check that additional metadata as well um, because that's a, a core part of what we do is that kind of quality assurance and making sure that everything matches um, and if you know a readme file says that this data set is supposed to be a CSV but someone has uploaded a, you know some other kind of file like we would we would go back to the author and, and ask them what that was what that was about. So that curation process is really key to to what we do and and how we envision this this working in the future. Yeah, yeah. So definitely that the this generalist file format that I guess you can you can check relatively easily with. Uh, we don't necessarily need to know uh, the, the, the content very much. You just need right. to understand whether the format CSV is one of them. You could have XML as, as another one, uh, but there's some more general, there's some more specialized file format as well. And mm -hmm. one of the things that we, uh, like other people have been working on is creating validators, uh, so uh -huh. program that one can run and, and, and check whether the format actually conform to a specification. Yes. I'm wondering if it's something yeah. that you would be interested in having in your hand, for I specific see, yeah. files. Yeah. Um, Th that's that sounds fantastic. Yes, we we do that already since we get a lot of tabular data as as I mentioned we do we do a tabular data validation. Um so so we we already have a kind of a um a, a, an example of that in place and um so I think that would be a really interesting thing to 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 try to pilot as well as doing um discipline specific format validation as well. Yeah. I, I got plenty of other questions, but I, I, I might let somebody else speak first. Uh, yeah, Doreen, do you want to hop in now? We can't hear you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to give Tim a first pass there. So following up on that, there are there are for several of these things existing validators. So mm -hmm. I think you know I think it's like really important because both. Tim and I and this group work with multiple with projects where we go routinely to Dryad and pick mm -hmm. up the material from you um, there. And, and so first off, let me say thank you very much for that, because there are many data sets that don't have an explicit place and being able to put in Dryad has really been uh, incredibly valuable. But I, I, I really wonder what your thoughts are following up on um, what would be required for you to support pointing them to those validators or things? What could we do to help you? So mm -hmm. that's one question. And then the other thing that I think is really interesting about Dryad, and I'm not necessarily sure if I missed it, but you really have an opportunity to review what type of data sets have already been deposited. And mm -hmm. if you have boluses of those data and there aren't other locations, there becomes an opportunity to develop a community to define yes. a better format for those. And I'm curious of whether you've identified examples of gaps like that and whether there's an opportunity to use Dryad to coordinate more of a synthesis of that there. So like, for instance, 
like if we just asked you a question very specifically, how many data sets do you have from agronomically important species? And let's just say we we gave you something across uh, animals, plants, and insects as as an example. Um, um, and then uh, what are the district? What is the could is there a way that we could get from you information on the types of data that have been deposited about that? Um, to actually get from you information on on what types of data sets you're routinely seeing. And then perhaps mm -hmm. there's a way that we could come up with recommendations of pointing in directions of best practices of that. I think that's that's a fantastic idea. It's it's something we have discussed with our we have a scientific advisory committee um, and it's something we've discussed recently with them is is kind of identify is exactly this identifying emerging file formats or file formats that aren't well served by existing repositories um, and and developing a community around that and developing standards around that. Um, and I do think we could get the kind of of um, of information that you're asking for. Uh, we you know we again we're limited by the you know kind of free text keywords that all you know the author supplied information, but we could certainly um, we could certainly run a query like that, and we do have you know file extension information that's searchable, so we'd be able to see what you know what kinds of, of file types are associated with with those. So yeah, Thank I'd be you. happy to follow up with you about that. That would, that would be great because I think I think that it's a way for us to basically target that and then perhaps even make recommendations when journals are coming to you of this is what they should ask their people to do before they just dump and run. Uh, you know, because Absolutely. there was this, there was this recently, I didn't go to this meeting, but um, there was a comment that came out of the bio curators meeting that our uh, I think the newly developed word was crap ohm uh, because it's like, you know, if people are dumping things to you, but with the minimal effort, they could be dumping things to you that really could be useful, like, more useful than it is right now. Yeah. And I, I think you've you've touched on another point there, which is I think you know Dryad has you know has this uh, you know has relationships with all with a lot of journals, uh, and so we can influence researchers in through that pathway as well. And we we you know we worked the the editor the screenshot of the editorial I showed in the in the presentation is something that we've been kind of involved with the the authors or around um, developing and and kind of you know we are we have those kind of relationships and, and that's definitely a pathway to, to better educate the journal editors around how to, to develop their policies in ways that support, um, you know, reusable data sharing, high quality data sharing, and not just, uh, just for compliance. Yeah. Thank you. Once again, I just want to say you guys are doing a great job. Thank you. <laughs> um, Megan, you have a question? Yeah, though I'm thinking maybe I might rephrase it because of what we were just talking about, like that who is the decision maker, I think is really key for this because um, I run an institutional repository, mm -hmm. we get stuff sent to us, we get told the description, it's hard for us to validate if that's actually that, what it is because of the sure variety we see. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially if it's grant funded, the PI is usually the one in charge of deciding where it goes, right? So there's like what rewards, what redirections can we put in there? Editors are definitely one thing, but for the last 10 years, most of them haven't been interested. So how can we change their minds, I guess is my question, <laughs> or can we change their minds? Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's a good question. I do think the... Um, you know, the, the, the Nelson memo, I think is changing things. I do think there's more, you know, there's more top down direction now and research, you know, we certainly are seeing that at Dryad, we're getting, you know, more, more interest than ever from, um, from institutions, from, you know, academic institutions that are interested in becoming Dryad members because they, they see they're, they're getting panicked phone calls, <laughs> um, from, from researchers, you know, they're, they're seeing an uptick already in, um, not necessarily in data deposit yet. Um, I think we're, we're not quite, we haven't quite reached that, uh, that wave yet, but they're seeing an uptick in requests for data management planning support. Um, so it's kind of the precursor to the, the data deposit, um, and, and that, and the guidance has been more explicit on, 
on what it means to share data as well. And, and, and what it means is sharing it in an appropriate disciplinary repository first off, and if not sharing it in, in a trusted generalist repository as well. So I do think there's better, I, I do think that's going to influence behavior. Like it is, it, you know, there, and, um, Dryad is is a part of this uh, generalist repository ecosystem initiative that's that's organized by NIH um, that's you know helping to to ensure that all of the generalist repositories are meeting certain standards so that we'll, there will be improvement across the board in the the quality of data curation and publishing and preservation no matter what uh, recommended repository researchers choose out of that ecosystem. Um, so I think that's that's you know that's part of uh, part of it. I I think in our aspiration and what we like to think is that it is we'd like to see researchers actually seeing the the value of of data reuse um, either because they're reusing data themselves or because they see the impact on other research, they see that others are using their work and benefiting from it. Um, you know, whether it's researchers who don't have access to that kind of equipment and, and so they can benefit from having, having, you know, data from that someone else has produced or because they're uh, you know, students who are using, using data to, to learn, um, about data analysis, um, or data science. Um, you know, I, you know, that's, that's our ultimate our ultimate goal is to see motivation based on on researchers seeing the value in in putting data out there to be reused. Thank you. Um, I, so, Damien, you had a couple of comments. Did you want to um, speak to any of the points in the chat? There's some questions about um, great to see data repositories look to a shared model of experimental design to access data sets besides bags of terms. Are you able to? Yeah, I could say. Yeah. I'll Thanks. Just, yeah, just vocalize. <laughs> um, I mean, it's it's neat to see so many different fair data repository projects coming online and uh, offering the hunger, the need for it, for the sharing. Um, the two moves that would be, well, three moves would be great. One. Uh, promoting a um, an OAuth style um, authentication system across these uh, repositories, so you can recognize that somebody says through their ORCID when they log in that they're so and so, and then that provides more seamless access across these platforms. So that would be like one one uh, future progression. Another one would be um, already mentioned. Um, uh, um, I forgot who it was that was mentioning it, but the um, the adoption of an external specification scheme. So I, you said Cedar mm -hmm. was your um, target, and um, that comes with a bundled sort of uh, data platform for managing data. So I guess you're looking to tighter integration that way. Um, but choosing a, a schema system that takes on uh, representing just about anybody's data would be great mm -hmm. across these repositories. So mm -hmm. <laughs> not just adopting it, but sort of promoting it for adoption by other systems. Um, and then the last thing would yeah. be so many of us are forced to just do bag of terms, even if they're coming from an ontology to describe the data at a meta level, not down to the field level. The schema yeah. thing should take care of the field level but we're still missing the experimental design structure. Mm -hmm. um, and when researchers are confronted with databases of not just hundreds now, thousands soon, millions in the future, we will need to hop up to be able to describe the experimental design that mm -hmm. matches our data federation needs for a particular project. And so um, my eye was caught by this experimental design assistant project because it kind of shows diagrammatically how any researcher could provide a view of what their experiment was and it's therefore it's data. Um, and if only a system like that would also generate the metadata, which they haven't yet, they promised to uh, soon. <laughs> so adopting an experiment, a shared experimental design. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. Rex, you had a question. Oh, sorry. Did you have, have a response? No, I think th these are these are great points, and I, I guess my only response is yeah, is it, uh, is I will I'm gonna look into to um, the links that that you that you posted, and, and uh, may have some questions for you uh, as well. But um, but yes, thank you for sharing sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Too. Rex, do you want to go ahead? Yes, um, I was just wondering if you have any feel of how many submissions you lose during the submission process and a follow-up to that would be if the if the requirements for submission are too high are you afraid that what will develop will be a shopping for the whoever has the lowest bar yeah, great questions. Um, so the the first answer is yes, we have as soon as a submission is started, it's basically stored forever uh, in in Dryad. so we we can see you know exactly how many submissions have been abandoned um, and see that over time. And it's something that we could use as a benchmark and I think would use as a benchmark if we were testing out changes to the submission process or adding additional metadata to see if that resulted in a higher rate of abandoned submissions um, or you know affected the um, the submission that used the researcher behavior at all. Um, uh, and um, uh, can you repeat the second part of your question? Oh, whether what would develop out there since there's more than one repository is that the user would just shop around right. for whichever is the easiest to submit to. We we see that we definitely see that behavior already. I think you know I think we we see anecdotally I've seen that. Um, you know I know there um, there are repositories that have lower lower barriers to entry than Dryad um, that that don't require as much metadata entry that don't have a curation process. So it's um, you know immediate um, and th there's no lag time um, that that don't. Um, that don't have the same, um, uh, you know, data validation step that we do for tabular data and those kinds of things. So anecdotally, I think that already does happen. Um, and it, it is concerning to a certain extent. I think, again, I'm, I'm optimistic that, um, that these, that in this new policy environment that we're in, that that's not going to it's not going to pass muster um, it, that the, these policies explicitly require that data that's shared be sufficient of sufficient quality to be reproduced. Um, and if that's not the it, so if if researchers are taking shortcuts, that's likely not going to be the case. Um, uh, and we can provide you know Dryad can provide that assurance. And I think I, I think. So for you know for compliance, um, I think we can provide the peace of mind to researchers too who are concerned about compliance and whether they're doing the right things. Um, we can provide that kind of that peace of mind that that repositories with a lower barrier to entry can't necessarily provide. Um, uh, but I I think your your point is is really is um, is is very well taken. So I'd, I'd like to follow up a little bit on that too. Having just recently looked at a paper where like whole um, genome assemblies were included as um, files in a, a Dryad repository record, you know, thinking like, oh, that's really not the place that I would have wanted that data to go mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think there's an interesting, you know, opportunity to sort of track this, the reusability of, you know, similar types of data in different places, and then sort of ultimately see how that shakes out. But I wanted to get back to at least from the from AgBio data, one of the um, groups or one of our working groups is what we're calling the Fair Scientific Literature Working Group, and you know this gets to the question of like sort of how to guide authors, you know authors and publishers, you know we're sort of um, looking at how to um, create this kind of a decision tree or how to you know aid researchers mm -hmm. or even generalist repositories. So how could we go about sort of um, working with with Dryad because like, we recognize you know, there's definitely a lot of as you said a lot of data types that our specialist repositories don't necessarily accept but there are things that we do and we would like mm -hmm. to see you know in there or we would like to see in formats 
Um, so how can we how can we go about working with you? I, I think it would be. It, yeah, I think it would be interesting. I mean, I'd, I'd be interested to, um, I think you, you and I talked uh, when we talked one-on-one -on -one about getting someone from Dryad involved in that in that working group. And I think, you know, our head of publishing or one of our um, curators would would be a great, would be, um, I'll, I'll, I can connect with them to kind of, to loop them into that group maybe. But I think I could see doing, you know, doing a pilot of, of trying to, um, of uh, adding that to our kind of curator training of uh, of if if they have documentation available that that says you know th this is this kind of th this re these repositories exist for these types of data and if you when you spot them you know consider um, consider uh, sending you know direct asking authors if they've considered sending data there I could also see in the future building something that would be more automated that we could build some something into the system that recognizes keywords or recognizes um uh you know that pulls out um it pulls out topics from a submission and set you know and and prompts a researcher you know have you considered these other sources you know that I think that's um that's a feature that would be really useful to, to researchers. And um, uh, finally, I can see a, a possibility if we were piloting doing one of the, um, doing a CEDAR template or, you know, collecting discipline specific metadata, that that's an automatic flag that, you know, before a researcher gets to that temp, fills out that discipline specific metadata, they're asked, have you considered one of these discipline specific repositories if your data type is, you know, is X, Y, or Z? Thank you. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I will, I'll send you updated information about when that working great. group meets. And if you have somebody that is interested in participating, I think that would be really welcome. Um, Timothy has another question and maybe that might be the last one, um, but you've given your contact information too, so we can chase you down afterwards. Absolutely. So, Timothy, yeah. go ahead. Unless somebody else wants to go, uh, don't want to. It's uh, okay. I, I just wanted to uh, kind of pick your brain and uh, a, about about an idea, uh, maybe a kind of uh, a crazy idea. I, I think we often focus a little bit too much about where the data uh, reside and not how it resides and how. Mm -hmm. uh, I I really think that it doesn't especially in the, in in an era like now where uh, the cloud is uh, uh, is everywhere i think where it resides is not so important to me but how it is uh, stored and how it is available is much more important yeah. and i see things like file format uh, validation and metadata standard much more important and 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 cross uh, cross talk between repositories uh, much more important than really where it actually resides. I take the example of a uh, consortium like the INSDC, where when data is deposited in one place, it's it's streamed directly into a, into the other repository. And I'm wondering whether that's uh, kind of an end goal that is maybe more maybe, uh, ambitious, but still kind of better in the end. Yeah, no, I know. I think absolutely. I think you're you're absolutely right. The kind of who who owns the data isn't important. It's it's uh, the the goal is is to to get it out there in ways that are are discoverable and reusable that are that are fair. Um, and um, and you know we um, it, that's you know, Dryad makes all of our data and metadata available through an open API, um, and th that's something that you know. So th there's we we definitely we want to interoperate. We want to integrate. We want people to harvest our data, and you know, and so you know, we um, uh, that absolutely. I think I think that's um, that's the spirit that we're operating in. Yeah, I would love to continue to uh, talk about the different different aspects, especially especially how we can uh, uh, collaborate on 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 uh, data reuse. Um, yes. Yeah. Great. Good. Well, I I'd love to talk about that too to continue that conversation. Um, and yes, I'd like to continue a lot of the threads that have surfaced here. Um, so I do hope that you will all feel free to, to get in touch with me directly after this as well. And, and I'll be back in touch 
um, and and hopefully uh, uh, others from Dryad as well will will um, be in conversation with you all again. Thank you so much. These are great questions and great um, conversation. I thought so. Really appreciate the commitment both to open and fair data. And we look forward to um, enduring conversation. So thank you so much for all the work that you do and for your webinar. And with that, um, we'll be uh, talking later. Okay. Great. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Okay.